Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. Today, I'm sitting here with Anaisa Stewart. Hi, Anaisa, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So, Anaisa is a practitioner of healing hearts, an intuitive energy worker, soul alchemist, a sound healer, systemic constellations facilitator, and Reiki certified. And that means that you support people in feeling more balanced and having more clarity, supporting them in having access to their expansive and invigorating self. So I'm really happy to have you here as um, I'm touching the ground in Dili in, in East Timor and you are on the other side of the world in, in the Sacred Valley in Cusco, Peru. Welcome. And I thought it would, would be great we could we would start this conversation basically by knowing a bit of that, that you tell us a bit of your journey and how mm. how you came to do the work you do and how that somehow relates with the topic of our summit with conflicts and how to approach difficult uh, ten, tensions and situations in a in a mm. more healthy and generative way. Okay. That's a big question. So I'll start in the beginning, <laughs> how I came to do the work I do. Um, and I would say this beginning of my journey is through depression and really wanting to not feel depressed and really feeling that I came to earth to feel good. And I didn't understand growing up in Brooklyn, New York, you know, I grew up in a really sort of normative environment, going to good, good private schools and then jobs and offices and I was not happy in these internships and jobs and no one around me seemed happy and I was really confused I felt like I felt like I came to earth to do more to feel more and I was really I was really convinced that that there must be something more and so I started traveling and my entry way in some ways was through environmentalism I got really interested in farming and going back to the earth because I really felt that I had this realization that I'm nature and that I'm not separate from nature. And that made me really want to understand more about the food I'm consuming and more about how I can interact with my natural environment in a way that was really expressing the truth that I am connected to that natural environment. And growing up in a, in a, society, in a society, in a city where I felt really separate very separate from my environment. And I didn't know where most of my food came from. Like I didn't know what it looked like on the plant. And that became really important to me. I wanted to know what every food I consumed, what it looked like um, when it was in, was whether it was coming from the ground or from a tree or from a flower, I really wanted to know the whole process and be a part of it. So that was my entryway. And I was really feeling like farming, connecting with the earth would sort of move me out of my depression. But it didn't. I was traveling in Europe. I was woofing, which is working. I was doing work trade on farms, and I still felt depressed. And I remember sitting in this beautiful farm in the south of Spain and realizing that it's me. That like I've gone to all these places, and the only the only constant is me. So it must be something within me that's causing my depression. It's not. It wasn't external for me, and that thought uh, has. Cha like changed my life <laughs> so I, I went a deep dive inward and I really took to the practices of Buddhism and imper impermanence and self-inquiry and did a deep study you know as, as a good I would say English in college like a good English major I really studied it from an intellectual standpoint reading and like applying the practices but in some ways I felt It did help me out of depression, but it kind of moved me into this like sort of numbness. I felt like I was a bit apathetic, like I wasn't feeling here nor there because I was feeling um, the sense of, of, of understanding desirelessness and impermanence. It sort of left me feeling a bit, in some ways, empty. And then so like, continuing on the journey, I went to, I sat in my first Vipassana which is a 10-day silent meditation. And in that Vipassana, I understood presence. There's this Jim Elliott quote I had, I've had on my desktop for years, and it says, wherever you are, be all there. 
And I, ex- I experience full body presence for the first time in that Vipassana, my mind, my body, my awareness was all in one place. And it was so jarring to experience what I've read about for so long. And, you know, as they say, they, no one can experience it for you. You know, you can read about, you can read about these experiences, but when you experience it for yourself, it is a sense of indescribable magic because it, um, it's, it just is like, it's not outside of anything. And we've, we now live in a world where we are in so many ways, like thinking and moving and organizing and planning. And there's so many ways where we like cut ourselves off from, from what just is and experiencing that is, um, a, a deep, a deep sense of homecoming, but it's also a deep sense of wordlessness. And so I guess in some ways what brought me to this is this like a deep passion to understand what it means to be human. And so I've been on the journey for about seven years to really, in, in my own way, to understand what it means to be human. And that has led me to, through meditation, then certain gifts opened up. Like I received my Reiki certification. So I started understanding about energy and like, what does that mean to be an energy body and working with the energy centers. And then um, that grew into a much larger understanding of our multidimensional reality and like the fact that we are souls and that we are, our perception is um, expansive. It's much more expansive than you know, then we can see in our material reality. And in my deep inquiry, like this living, living in a deep questioning of, of like, what, what does it mean to exist right now? Um, and matching that inquiry with meditation and silence, many things opened up for me. And so that's sort of how I've come to the work that I do right now. And so I guess to the second part of your question, which is how does what I do relate to the summit coming down to earth and how to resolve conflicts? Um, I would say so much of the work I do is presencing, is to be able to come into an, the expansive business. And in, in that expansive business, we're able to sort of feel into wounds and traumas that want to speak. So in many ways we have inherited trauma, we have collected trauma and these, and people say these words, but what does that mean? It means we, we, and presently in our bodies, we have living wounds that have not been released and that have not been heard and have not been seen. And so I support people um, through what it, what it is, is is a deep sense of empathy and listening to bring space and awareness to the places in us that have not been, that have not been able to express themselves. And that allows a a deeper sense of, I would say, I mean, it's a, it's a high aspiration to say equanimity in some ways, you know, because there's a deeper sense of being able to interact with our environment from a sense of possibility rather than contracting, contracting every time it, it kind of doesn't go in our favor. And I would, I want to say the other side of that is sort of like realizing, like being in conscious present awareness that we are a part of a continuum, like in every point and every part of our lives that we are a continuation of, of, of ancestors and we are the ancestors of descendants and that we are in a part of our family and a part of the collective. In some ways that awareness, I feel also brings us out of a narrow mindset of like, I and this is what I want and if it doesn't go this way then everything is you know everything's falling apart to to realizing we are part of a, of a much larger organism that's more intelligent than this present moment and allowing and I would say that's more intelligent than this than this like when we're in a narrow when we're in a narrow super mental like now moment rather than that expansive infinite now moment and so when we're, when we're able to really bring forward that sort of awareness, I feel we're able to really look at conflict from a more generative point of view and really start seeing how our, tense, our tensions or just wounds that have been wanting to speak and haven't had the chance to and how to really work, work with those parts of ourselves. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I was I was thinking like in practical terms. So that there's there's a few things that came up for me. One one is in practical terms, like if I'm not present, for instance, to my to what my, my physical sensations and what I'm experiencing in my body. I might be like four days in a row sitting in front of the computer in the same position, doing work and not and, and left and noticing a lot of pains in parts of my body are just like screaming out for attention. And as soon as I get present to that, then that generates a lot of things. Like one of them is I will stretch more often. I will be uh-huh. called to, to know, go out and move. So I'm I'm thinking that that's a very practical example of of, but the, what you are opening up is there's a lot of things in there. One for me is this idea that <clears throat> this practical sense that the past is in the present because you said it in a very in a very clear way like all the the past deeds of our ancestors and the, their ways of being and doing continue to exist in us and so and in our cultures so a lot of what's what we um what might be calling for our attention today might come from those places but might also come from what's happening right now or might also be related what we expect to come in our way in the future. So also the way in the present we are open to that field of possibilities of what is emerging for us is something I think you tap on because in a way what we are saying is like, so I heard another thing is, and and, and that, that, that was very strong for me, is this idea that we, because we are un- unaware or we don't notice or we don't want to face difficult things that might be living inside of us or in our relationships with with others and with the world, we tend to put them aside or to try to exclude them from ourselves and say, no, this I don't want to deal with this now or find all sorts of strategies to run away from it. And my own personal experience with some of these dynamics is that they, they become more powerful. The more I try to run away from them or like avoid Avoid them. The more the the more things will will happen to call my attention or to call yeah. our collective attention. Uh-huh. So I, I would like to to ask you, like, can you tell what in practical ways how you approach these things with your with the people you work with? Like, what what does that this means in practice? Hmm. In practice, I feel like it's, you know, it's kind of two parts when I'm holding a session with someone and then when I'm teaching people, facilitating their their capacity and deepening their own intuition. Um, So when I'm in a session with someone, I would say, you know, I talk about practical terms because in some ways it's like, it's not practical. That's, and that's sort of the, that that is the bypassing of the mind, right? Because it's like you know, ha- and, and it's like how to describe your work. It's like, well, it's about uh, listening to what we're feeling right now, and then speaking from that place, and then sort of trusting, really trusting, not knowing, and letting the present moment kind of guide. And then so, okay, backing up. So what does what does that mean? I feel um, a part of my work is to um, allow people to say the things that they're afraid to say and to feel the things that they're afraid to feel. It's kind of what you're saying in terms of when we like push things aside. And, um, you know, I, f- I f- like with, with like a lot of lo- loving gentleness, I, I do my best to like, can we hold it like right in front of our hearts and breathe with it and, and know that, these things are a part of us, but do not define us. I feel like many people feel a lot of shame and feel a lot of um, pain around the parts of them that are, that are in pain because they feel that they, that there shouldn't be like that, or that it should be in a certain way. And honestly, uh, there is no one way to be with your pain or to be with um, some sort of wounding because 
we are all so unique and it's the same way. There's no one way to access your power or to really live into your intentions and to move forward in your life because we're all so unique. And so I feel also a part of the work I do is to really, as much as I, as much as we can to be, I keep saying to be with what is present, but it means to not come with our ideas of what, of how things should be or how we want them to be, but really to be with, how things are and and sometimes just really witnessing something in honesty is very healing just that like just being witnessed in in honesty is so transformative because we we see how we've been kind of covering that and when it is exposed to the light it really it, it it's it sort of um regenerates itself you know there really it really is a is a, is a process of um, moving past uh, fears of how we're seen and, and being really okay with who we are and, and standing in that. Yeah, I was, I was um, looking back to how much in, in some of my initial work, facilitating groups and and learning processes i would observe people just it's a very like uh, omnipresent um, way of uh, of being in in society in the western world of just people i could see them the faces of people everybody including myself in many occasions that just like instead of being deeply listening to what each person is bringing, just to think like, what am I going to say when it comes to my turn or just trying to hear my own thoughts about it and, and try to come up with something intelligent and, and brilliant to show up, just, just to satisfy a very basic need that you are talking about, this need to be, to be seen. Even, even ourselves, I think there's a, the, when we start that path, it's very liberating. For me, it has been one of the most liberating processes of just, uh, yeah, just looking at parts of myself that wanted to be seen for a long time and start to look at them in a more curious way, not get stuck yeah. in these processes of shame, of fe a fear of being judged and, and, and so that there's, there's something really powerful there. And I can imagine also very difficult because I mean I can I can imagine I know it's very difficult because even yeah. these days I I think that's the kind of work that never ceases to be done because there's always layers and more things that you uh -huh. find out that that I need to that I'm finding out that I need to work uh, and to integrate but yeah um, I don't know I'm still curious to see like. So another thing, and perhaps that opens up a bit, a bit more of, of possibilities for our exploration together. And is <clears throat> you mentioned something about how difficult it is to talk about a practice, and I really resonate with that because the moment we start to put words in something like what we are talking about, we kind of deaden it. We kind of make it a tool, and we are actually what what I'm hearing you say is that actually this is something that is more is alive so it's not like we're going to download a set of tools and of uh, you know ways of seeing into the situation mm -hmm. is actually the the other way around is like how we can be our, ourselves uh, um, open and engaged with the other in such a way that we help we kind of support the other in becoming seen and and seeing himself or herself in ways that that can um, get us closer to what is really alive in us, uh -huh. uh, and so there's this, there's this, yeah, there's this tension because in a way it's not a practice; it's a way of being in the world, or of being a way of being with each other. So uh -huh. I wonder, I wonder what, how this this lands in you, and what 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 else could you say about that? Uh -huh. well, I just loved how you said it's a way of being open and engaged because. I just loved, the, I loved hearing you say those words because yes, I feel this way. And I, I agree. It's a practice. I mean, it's one, you know, you can receive a beautiful family constellation or a sound healing. You can receive a, a beautiful healing experience and you can release um, an aspect of, of, of trauma or pain that has been a part of your life. But to really, I feel like, 
be wholly integrated on, on, you know, the multiple levels that we exist on. It's a, it's a daily, a daily practice of like really being, choosing to be aware of your thoughts and choosing to um, be self-aware and curious and yet not judgmental. You know, it's, it's, it's just a, like a teeter totter and something um, in terms of, you know, tools or how to really make it more accessible. I'm, I've started a course called into soul wisdom and it's three months long and it sort of, follows my own path of coming to the state of self-reflection, I would say, um, to really develop uh, that way of being. To be So you have more access to being curious with your emotions and not judging yourself or others for them. And these things, and the judgments still happen, right? Because as you said, it, it, sometimes it feels, I actually... <laughs> I don't know. I have, I'm highly optimistic. It's not endless, but like, who knows? So it feels like there's many, it feels like there's a trauma for every cell in the body in some ways, you know, there's some, there's always something else that wants to emerge, but um, in the structure of the course, it, the first month is, is just meditation. You know, it's really coming back to ourselves as breathing beings and, and being in that practice of returning to the breath. And then it felt, goes into the self inquiry meditation, which is who am I? And really, starting to f just ask yourself that that question in, in your you know if it's the heart or if it's that it's the place within the heart without a name and really just it's a practice you know thoughts come and then returning to the practice and then the third week is um body scanning and then the second month moves into understanding empathy so i feel like a big part of something that um i've I've, I've received information about and have practiced is really understanding how to be in, to be in empathy with parts of myself. So it's sort of the example I use, I use a lot is beauty. So uh, everything is alive. Everything has a life. Everything has energy within it. Every from like the scarf you wear to your bag, to the tree, to ideas and ideologies, they take a life form of their, of their own and they exist, they exist in the world. And so it's sort of like coming, taking a moment to be silent with yourself and then looking at a concept or ideology, such as beauty. When I did this practice with myself for the first time, when I looked at beauty, I suddenly felt really sad and I saw the words beauty and it was really, it felt really contained because it's, if we have all these concepts of what beauty is and beauty is everything. It just like wants like burst. It wants to burst out of the word of beauty. And, and it was just show it was, I was seeing just every, everyone and everything on earth is beauty. And that practice of really feeling what something is separate from you, but, but understanding how that belief is living within you is, um, a practice of really being able to understand what you're believing and really slowing down and looking at like, Oh wow, these are my belief systems. It's easy for me to say that um, beauty is everywhere. Right. But I'm actually conditioned with the outside ideas of beauty and it's, and it hurts me. Like it's, it causes pain in me because maybe I feel I'm outside of that concept and I'm actually deeply believing that even though that belief causes shame. So I'm not looking at it. Right. So if it's like, can we be quiet enough and be still enough to really look in whatever way it shows up, if it shows up in a sound or a feeling or a sensation to really allow ourselves to trust the unknown and, and listen to what's inside of us. Um, so that that's one tool I find really interesting as a way of um, understanding our unconscious belief systems and our unconscious mind. And um, move forward from that. Something that's coming up that I want to share is just about um, manifestation and materialization of things. And and this is, you know, this I know this, and yet I know it's still practice for me because a lot of times we, on the surface, are are trying to materialize or manifest something, but our deep belief system is still actually the opposite of what we're. We're actually believing that you know if you if you want to manifest that car, but you really believe that you'll like you'll never have a, a that car. You know, even though you're saying it constantly, that the belief system is like that you're not worthy of it, and so that's actually what we're manifesting. So it it's such a it is a practice of slowing down and being super tender with yourself.
some some people call it the the inner saboteur. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that that I was thinking as I heard you, I was sinking into how how challenging it is today in you know in a, you know the modern world where we are exposed since a very early age to uh, different ideals that are shaped by marketing and you know like uh, consu- consumism. So that that is at the root of a lot of, of pain in a lot of in a lot of us because we're just like comparing ourselves to to images and to ideas that are actually fabricated and i think a big part of of maybe the pain of is that deep down inside we know that this is not true but uh yeah. but we kind of fall in the trap of the of the stories just, just like the the kids' stories. I'm, I'm, and I'm now. Um, I have two, two, two kids, twins, uh, two teen boys, four and a half years old. And I'm very wary when I, when I sometimes read stories to them, the children's stories. How much these stories also are charged with this kind of, you know, this, this worldviews, these mind frames that get us stuck in, you know, like everybody has to be a princess or a king, and there's always the, 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 the man would. Do be in a certain way and the woman in another way, and usually women are portrayed as having to be beautiful or in the in a, only the beautiful women get the or a certain kind of beauty gets the the prize or the mm-hmm. gets to live to live happy, happily ever after. So that's that's a very that's a very you know subtle way that we keep uh, stuck and propagating these these um, narratives these worldviews. And yeah, and then we spend part of our adult world uh, trying to integrate this, yeah, yeah. to integrate this, this, and to to try to make sense of of what that means for us as mature adults. Uh-huh. I don't know if you see any difference in your in your practice between. Uh, Men and women, um, mm. but I'm I'm, mm. I'm particularly um, acute aware of uh, how for men it's harder to get in a stage when they become uh, when we become adults uh, of of dealing with these things because we grow up in a more in a in a kind of culture that that is very er- from very early stage uh, demanding that we. You know, hide and and don't oh. don't show up fully, and so I think also the lack of rituals for for young young men to become adults and to have a mature phase means we are always seeking that independence that leads us to be quite irresponsible towards uh, many many of what is more community communitarian aspects of life of, of recognizing those entanglements the relationships and all the different nuances that that involves i don't know do, do you have i can imagine you have much more uh, women than men um, working with you <laughs> exactly i do <laughs> i do <laughs> yeah and I, and i want to pull out something you said which is that somewhere deep down we know it's not true like all, all of these images we see, and that's the deepest pain. And I would say that now talking about women and men, but in some ways, women have, have allowed to um, explore and grow their emotional intelligence from a young age where men in many societies have not been. So it's okay for a girl to cry, but if a boy cries, then they're a girl or, or, they're, or they're, in, they're, they're not as manly. That is so dangerous. Wow. Like how dangerous. Um, that I, I feel like in some ways we that is one of the core wounding of our of our system is that is that from a young age men aren't allowed to cry and are not allowed to um, develop their emotional intelligence in the way that women are. So even though you have a systemic oppression of women intelligence throughout 
the system, there is still um, the capacity to explore it, right? And in the way that the, that capacity is, is shut down from a very young age in men. And so what I've seen, which, you know, when you ask a question, I thought it was interesting, no one's ever asked me that, but actually what I see in my client and my clients is that men uh, argue with me a bit more and um, like really want their, uh, their, their, their outcome, their like objective. They like came and they're like, they really want their outcome. And when they don't have, they, when I don't say the thing they want to hear, because once again, I'm working with the unknown, you know, I mean, I trust, I trust what I, I trust what is presented, but it might not be what, what we think is what we wanted or we think what we're going to hear. And generally speaking, women are so much more porous to receiving and releasing than men are. Generally speaking, this is my experience with the clients that I've seen. And yeah, it's really, it's really it, like on that level, it's really interesting. On another level, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking in some ways, you know, because we live in a majority patriarchal um, led world and that sort of firm idea, that sharpness against the woman's in intuition. And sometimes I say, I feel like <laughs> um, people want to institutionalize my intuition because I, you know, there's a way that you need accolades and certificates. There's a way that there's a certain processing to show that you're, that you're worthy and gifted and, you know, the indigenous way that we are relearning, that we are re-remembering is, is, is one of um, deeply feeling your environment and not being separate from it and learning what it means to be where you are. I mean, that is the, I, I hope I'm not um, being generalist, but I feel like that is the indigenous, like human beings. They remember I'm here in Peru and I had a beautiful conversation with a woman who now lives in Cusco and is very much Cuscanian, but grew up in the jungle. Um, I, I maybe two hours, two, no, I think like six hours from Cusco. So like two, I don't remember. I'm not going to say times, but in the deep in the jungle and listening to her talk about her childhood and hearing how she's in awe of herself. Like she was saying how we would, they would, um, I think they would, oh, they would run when they were children. They would play tag in the jungle. I know there's unsteady rocks, there's rocks falling, there's vines, and they would run so fast and they wouldn't fall, they wouldn't trip. And she was saying, how, how did I know which rock was steady and how did I know which rock was loose? And there was something, it was just something so, I felt like I was receiving such a, such a gift because you know, we were in a time when there might be the indigenous shaman that comes to the Western gathering and is in like, you know, in the garden. that's, that's beautiful. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but there is something so genuine and present and, and heart, like heart pulling about listening to this woman talking about her childhood and how much she misses the river in the jungle and how there is nothing like living in that river in the jungle. And, you know, there's a part, there's, there's a part of me that longs to remember what it means to live like that, whether it means to mm. be in that deep communion with my natural environment. And I feel a part of this work of developing one's intuition and one's um, sensitivity and knowing how to respond to conflict is really what I said in the beginning is that we are extensions of nature and to really model what we, what we see the trees and what we see the birds and what we see the bees and what we see the bears doing because they are, um, uh, an e they are an ecosystem and, and we are ecosystems. Like my being is an, is an, is a natural mm. ecosystem and a part of the way I've learned to, remember myself as a natural environment is by seeing my natural environment and and knowing that I'm not separate from it. Yeah, that would I would add also that we are not at the center of it. We are we are a part yeah. of it. Uh, we are deeply embedded in it. So there's something in the experience you were describing when of, of the little girl running in the forest and 
Yeah, I heard John, John Yang tells a nice story. He's a tracker and he was learning tracking also with some, some of the tribes in the Kalahari Desert in Namibia. And, and it tells this story about uh, they follow this, this uh, local tracker the, the chasing for, um, I think, a leopard, a leopard or a leopard or something. And they walk for a few hours, a couple of hours, like really in, in zigzags and, you know, across the savanna. And they, they see the, the leopard and then something happens that they, they need to search fast for the car. Mm. And they would just like, oh, we need to go back and search for the car. And the tracker just gets into this kind of uh, moment of just tuning in. And suddenly it will just like make like this and go on a straight light, a straight yeah. line. And after an hour or so, they would be in front of the car. And, you know, they would go just straight, not not like coming back in the same zigzag ways that they've came or so. There, there, there's a way in which this person is so deeply connected with their, with the, with the local environment, with the ecosystem, that there's more ways of knowing than what we in the West are are uh, used to, to yeah. tap into. So that, that's that's interesting. I think, in a way, I don't know if we can talk a bit about that because, for me, this thing around presencing and working with being, being really here with. And, and tending to what is really alive in certain moments really brings us to what some people call being in the zone or in flow mm. or so this kind of moment where you know everything falls into place and you mm-hmm. you just feel like you are part of a whole that is moving mm-hmm. all together with an intelligence that is not only fixed on you so there's a sort of a, this sense that identity expands that time slows down there's different things can do you do you experience this when you are doing sessions with people? In the- <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I feel I do. I was, I was so, I was so ex- I just love hearing that description because it really is um, our sense of awareness expands. It's, it's exactly that. It's not located. It's not centered here. It's not. It's not centered on just the eye. It really, um, you know, I love how you said not in term to remember that we're not at the center of it because in some ways it feels to me that my awareness um, goes on to include it like it opens to include the person I'm sitting with and so I'm my awareness is located um, somewhere in between in some ways I'm not sure where it's located it it's because it mm. it switches but I I do feel in some ways I leave myself and I leave myself to be empty to reflect whatever wants to be presented in that, in that moment. Um, and it's also, uh, when we connect with our greater body, it's at, it's at the hands of grace. It's, like, it's at the expression of grace and the divine. And it's so, uh, out of me i it really is um the depth of the the depth of um the work i can do with anyone is the depth of my connection with source is how i feel and because it's my it's the vibration from which i'm sitting in is that which is in any way healing from for another person it's and it's not so much what i do or what i know it's more about if I can relax enough to allow something that's so much greater than me to come through and be present for both of us. In some ways we're both receiving from the divine, you know, it's not like I'm giving anything. And there's also for me in that way, I feel really safe in the work I do. I feel really quite relaxed with it and I really enjoy it because um, and that's also, I think, a different than the normative schedule where it's like I have to prepare and I have to like learn things. Like, you know, for me, like I, I just have, to, I just meditate, I just breathe and meditate and then I'm, you know, I'm ready to work. And I love that. I like love that I don't have to do much preparation for the work I, I share in the world. That brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> I, I think you do preparation, it's just preparation that is, in a way, your way of living, you know, like you exercise right. in, in different ways. Like people go to the gym, you, you do your That's own so daily practices or daily ways of, of tuning into 
<laughs> where you are. I want to. Uh, so there's there's two things I want to I want to kind of bring. bring. One is uh, something you touched upon that that is very dear to me. That is empathy, and you know, having empathy with parts of yourself, but also and then having empathy with others and compassion, which I think is essential to this kind of expansiveness of of meeting the other. Uh, halfway sort of say, but at the same time, I, I I I think often people confuse that because it's very easy also to be still in a place of downloading or of like assuming that you know what the other is feeling and, and experiencing yeah. when, and then you bypass actually what the other person is really experiencing because, yeah. I mean, I can be very, compa- very uh, empathetic, but I will never know what it means to be a woman or a black woman or a black woman that is a mother just because it's like so you know i can i can get closer by by really being present and deeply listening to the experiences of of uh, such uh, such kind of experiences but i will never fully be able to to grasp the whole totality of what it means to to be in that uh-huh. place because my life experience is so different so i might assume some things and that that can also be dangerous so that uh-huh. was one of the things I wanted to point out. And then just to kind of a bit of um, uh, re- resume a bit of what I'm hearing from you uh-huh. and to see if there is what, what else is missing that we might want to touch uh, in, the, in the time we have left. One thing, so one, one step I found that is really relevant is this kind of journey into uh, becoming more self-aware and so to really be... Uh, more curious and less judgmental to our own selves and to what is present in us and to really be um, yeah, conscious about the subtleties of that because we work mm-hmm. with different things. So there's the, the physical body, there's the emotional body, there's the mind, the thought uh, body, and then other more nuanced, uh, subtle uh, ways that extend much beyond our physical body and, and mesh with the rest of the world. And then but doing that process, which not like I'm going to be, in, you know, go to the mountain now and spend some, some years there until I'm totally able to navigate the world. Is As we do this engaging with the world, because we are, this is all in relationship, uh, we need to approach others and situations with the same kind of gestures of inner, curiosity of being aware of how we judge because i mean we might not be able to say like i got a moment in my life where i suspend all the time the judgment we know that it's there but we we are more we become more aware and so we can kind of put it put it in check and say okay how much this is i'm judging and then make a shift towards what is really what is really happening in this situation and being compassionate, empathetic to, to the other and to ourselves in what we are feeling in that experience. And I'm kind of bringing that again to conflict or tension situations, right? Where we need to be sort of mindful of what's happening with us and what's happening with the situation and how much might be there that is beyond, you know, our familiar ways of how oh, this is, this person is attacking me and then, uh, respond with all sorts of um, habitual ways that don't serve anybody. Yeah. What, what else are you kind of, have you been exploring that you think is relevant for this kind of different way of being in relationship with ourselves and with the world? Mm. That is at the base of your practices of your work. Mm. Well, I guess there's two things I want to say. And the thing I want to say in, re- in response to what you said is in response to this question, which is when you spoke about um, the dangers of, of projecting your experience onto someone else. And also when it's maybe your, when you may think you're feeling someone, but you're feeling your own trauma and it's actually blocking you from actually being present with someone. I just, that's a whole, there's so many nuances in that. And, and this, I don't know if this will, get pushed back and up. I kind of want to challenge what you said about not knowing the experience of the other, because I really feel that this, that this is a sort of a bypass that many people do. And that prevents us from truly caring and being in deep love with another person saying that I'll never understand what it's like to be them. And I think there's a level of respect 
that happens when people say that, that there's a level of, um, of course, there's so many walks of life that I'll never know. I mean, there's so many walks of life that no one person will know because we're all so unique. But I really feel there can be, there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. And I, I feel like when we're truly empathetic, we can actually, um, in constellations, you, this, we use this term called organs of perception. So we actually expand our ability to feel the other in ourselves. And when we do this, like when this happens in constellations, you have, you'll, I mean, you'll, I don't think you can ever walk up to someone of a, you know, the opposite race and gender and be like, I was in the constellation constellation and now I know, you know, but I feel like I, there, there are so many um, maybe stereotypes or ways of being in the world. I have so much understanding for and um awareness of if if i'm oh we talked about males before if i if i can feel in my own in my body like in a, in a really subjective way which also is you know not every, everyone has different capacities right but of a male so then when males are um, patriarchal or misogynist or this or that i'm able to understand the inner, chi- the, the inner child that never um, felt it was safe to be a woman. I'm able to feel in, I can, I'm able to feel the, the pain beneath the ignorance and the sadness and the fear. And when we're able to listen at these deep levels, I really believe that we're able to presence a different, a different world. And I feel that in so many of these conflicts, um, we have anger and anger and I want to be seen and I want to be seen but but I want my pain to be seen I want my pain to be and like there's so much pain there's so much pain holding these dynamics and when we say we'll never understand we we cut off the opportunity for for us for coming to really moving forward together so yeah that's something I feel really passionately about (laughs) and yeah, and the other thing I want to say that when you ask me like what else is present in the work I do or in re- reference to the topic is um, is love and compassion. You know, it's really – and it, how deeply can we love ourselves? You know, how deeply can we love all the parts of, all the parts of us we don't like and all the parts of us we do like um, and – and in some ways, even the thing, the thing I was naming in terms of if there's a male and really feeling the pain that's underneath the ignorance, it's can I can I really be sensitive to the pain to my the pain that's underneath my ignorance? Can I really be sensitive to that part of myself so I can hold a sensitivity for another person? And you know, as we're speaking and then bringing it back down to earth and to the really practical terms, I these are these are these are big, big movements, you know, from where, from where we're now operating, you know, these are big movements. But before we started the recording, we were speaking about how, you know, right now we're in quarantine. Like right now we're in a time when the um, coronavirus is shutting down the world and we are socially distancing. We are going into, we're not going into the, the mountain, and the cave, but we are, we are, if we choose, we're going to a time of self-reflection and meditation. And, um, I would hope that people are spending a, not all their time on, on their screen, you know, and really spent like using this opportunity to just feel themselves and feel where they are in their lives and feel where we are in a collective life that has brought us to this, to this point of basically a worldwide shutdown, which is incredible. It's an incredible moment. Like right now where we're living to, and I'll be so curious where this moment leads us to, but I just, I just really want to open, open the doorway that we are a part of an inter, interconnected web of intelligence. And through that interconnection, we actually can feel the other. We actually can. And through that feeling, we can hold their pain equally to our own. And there can be true forgiveness there and true um, understanding and actually creating the soil to move forward. 
Thank you so much for that. I was uh, I was just thinking like <clears throat> if we extend that to the to the more than human world. <coughs> sorry, what would it mean for us to 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 welcome this virus? Because in a way, if I've been studying a bit and reading about virus and they are they actually within our DNA and our genes there are there are virus we've met along the the human journey in the past with the in the planet. So I'm wondering like what is it to to meet this virus and what is trying to also bring us um, uh, as as gifts, not only as pains but also as gifts. So really uh -huh. meet that space, and that 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 called me like I don't know, but one exercise that that I think would be really interesting to invite people to do it. Maybe you have another one to add as they are sitting in their homes and you know sitting uh, and facing or meeting what's what's happening for them and in, in this particular moment in history is to kind of tap a bit into where is it that we are kind of uh, might be wanting, uh, dr driven to move away from as we think of this situation and what is it that we want to move towards as we kind of think in the, this moment of pause of like what we want to move towards in terms of our lives, in terms of our collective, our societies. As this is such an opportunity to to really bring about the the huge shift that many of us have been talking that is necessary, if we want to have a future <laughs> in the planet and and allow also and and nurture that that other species and life continues to flourish or and overcomes this this moment of uh, contraction. Let's call it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I feel. Uh, I like the practice you shared. I just, I, what keeps coming up to me is just like, it feels like a reset. Like we have an opportunity to really mm -hmm. reset our nervous system, reset um, our mental systems and s stop and pause. And it, it really, I mean, I really think it's incredible how everything is stopping and can, if we can really kind of, turn that external stop out in, internally and really take a moment to just breathe with everything we have come from to really, as you're saying, to, to really feel what we want to move forward into and really allow a, like a deep, a, a stop, like a really, to really, to really stop for a moment. And that's something I'm practicing right now is to really allow myself to stop because, you know, as, as people who are so um, charismatic about create, like, you know, building, creating new systems, it really, it's, there's so much, there's so much and there's so much to share and so much you, you want to um, be, a, there's so much to be a part of, but it's really important to really just let yourself come to deep rest. Cause it really is in the silence that we receive, um, True guidance, I feel. It's really in that in that deep, deep, quiet we receive clarity. Well, thank you so much, Anais. It was lovely. It was a lovely conversation. I can imagine we could stay here much longer talking about these things. And actually, I, I must say, I, I look forward to an opportunity to to do something physically present together in the future. Mm -hmm. I love the conversation. Thank you so much for showing up and for sharing your wisdom and, and your practice with the, with the world. Mm, thank you so much for having me and making it so comfortable <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> possible to do it together. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. And I'll stop recording.